I'd also like to acknowledge that this, this virtual event is being held on the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. My name is Rebecca Dennis, and I'm a member of the, NS, the NSCN, which is the Nova Scotia Environmental Networking Team. If you're unfamiliar with that, they're a nonprofit organization that connects environmental groups in Nova Scotia promoting communication, collaboration, and educational opportunities. And they act as a bridge helping groups, helping those groups work, work more efficiently. And they aim to strengthen environmental actions and awareness across the region. Joining us today is our guest speaker, Jess Lewis, who will talk about, she's sorry, she's a part of Nature Nova Scotia, and she'll talk about uh, Nova Scotia's very own mainland moose. She'll talk all about what's happening with the species, why they're at risk, and how Nova Scotia can help them. And we'll also have time at the end of the presentations for all your questions. So without further ado, here's Jess. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, can you see that okay? Thumbs up? Okay, thanks. So I'm Jess Lewis. I'm the conservation coordinator with Nature Nova Scotia, like Rebecca said. I wanna start off by saying thank you so much NSEN for hosting this webinar. Um, and just as a little bit about myself, the majority of work I do revolves around our Save the Mainland Moose campaign, but I also do work with Bird Friendly Halifax. And recently we've started a project with Nature Canada's Naturehood program. Um, personally, I've recently received a small grant for introducing insects to youth. So that's been really exciting and I'm looking forward to this presentation. So just to begin, really quickly, I want to note that we're not talking about the Cape Breton moose. I get this question all the time. Um, there are four subspecies of moose in Canada, and the mainland moose is a different population than the one found in Cape Breton. So the one in Cape Breton was introduced by Parks Canada. 18 individuals were dropped off in 1947 after the original moose species that lived there went locally extinct. So the Cape Breton Island population is currently sitting at around 5,000 animals. And you are actually, you know, you're able to hunt up there. The population is stable. There's a couple different reasons for that. Um, one being they have highlands up there. Everybody's heard of Cape Breton highlands. That's where the moose like to hang out. Um, they have thicker forest and uh, just more ideal habitat. Uh, moose are the only remaining native deer found in the Maritimes. We used to have caribou, but they're also now locally extinct. Um, that happened in the late 1800s. And there's a few reasons, one being overhunting and another being a disease called brain worm, which was introduced by white-tailed deer. And the deer at this time were slowly moving in from other parts of Canada by using logging roads and newly opened forests cleared by settlers but I'm gonna get more into that later. Looking at, um, looking at the population, we can see from this diagram, and this is from the 2003 status report that DNR put out. Um, you can see that we have kind of pockets of individuals across the province. So we have the Tobiotic region, then we have the Chibucto Peninsula, which is just below Halifax. And I've actually hosted a previous webinar on the Chibucto Peninsula before with um, Karen Beasley and also Mike Lancaster. Um, and that was really informational. They think there's between like 10 and 20 individuals down there, which is very interesting. We also have like the Terrence Bay Wilderness Area and then proposed Ingram River Wilderness Area, um, and recently Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes has, um, it, it sort of acts as like a connector piece, which is really important. Uh, we also have a pretty big population in the Cobequid Mountains, and then the Picto-Antigonish Guysboro, 
um, has a population and then a really small amount in Eastern Shore. I know we've received reports of moose in that area, so I know they are there. How many, we don't really know. Um, there's estimated between 3,000, or sorry, 300 to 1,000 moose. And pre-settlement numbers were sitting at 15,000. So um, 300 to 1,000 is not a lot compared to the original 15,000. Um, DNRR does population tracking a couple different ways. One through winter surveys. So they take out helicopters um, specifically after snow has fallen so they can see uh, like moose tracks and then it's easier to actually spot the moose from the helicopter. They also re rely on reporting from the public so they have a hotline um, as well as a link that I can share later um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later as well on how to report these sightings. Um, so yeah our, our moose, mainland moose are a little different um, they're not on average to be smaller than the other moose subspecies. So like I said earlier, there's four subspecies. Um, our average bull moose in mainland Nova Scotia will weigh just less than a thousand pounds um, with a 12,000 pound individual being really exceptional. So that is slightly smaller than usual. Um, moving on, I just want to go over quickly the, the history of how we got here, how the species, um, how, how the moose like fared over time. So in the 1700s, uh, moose were really plentiful when Mi'kma'ki forests were managed for multi-age structures. Hemlocks provided shade and small clearings provided regrowth and browse for the species. Um, then between 1700 to 1900s, we have European settlement, which really changed the topography of Nova Scotia. Settlers came in, cleared the landscape for farms um, and development. This changed hydrology. It also um, increased hunting pressures, especially on caribou and moose. Uh, we also see during this time period that large fires and drought became more frequent. Then we have the uh, 1800s, the deer arrived. So they were released by people, but they were also attracted to wide open spaces. So they were sort of able to follow settlement into Nova Scotia. Uh, then the 1900s, we have the rise of industrial forestry. Large older trees became nearly impossible to find. Clear cutting has around a 20 year turnaround. So that means the forest is being clear cut every 20 years. Now Nova Scotia has less than 1% old growth, um, which is kind of shocking when we think about the fact that our forests used to look like BC. The, the last legal hunting season for moose was in 1936 in the western end of the province and then in 1981 in the eastern end. But although legal hunting of the moose on the mainland is now banned, we are continuing to see a population decline. We also know that there's a reduction of forests and old growth in general, and this is causing um, habitat and diversity decline. So animals like the moose that rely on forests for habitat protection and food aren't able to find those same protections. So this is kind of just a summary, but I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into like the habits of the species. Moose have been studied pretty extensively in other parts of the world, specifically um, parts of Canada, like Alberta, They've also been studied in New Brunswick and quite frequently in the States as well, but not so much in Nova Scotia. Um, we do have a couple of papers, but one of the things I'm gonna talk about later is my current project, which is working on a conclusive literature review that sort of ties everything together. Um, so as of right now, I'm 
generalizing on the behavior of the Easter moose. So first I wanna talk about moose habitat. There's a lot of habitat that moose use and it's mainly seasonal. Uh, they move around a ton. In the summer, they'll want landscape areas that provide shelter, shade, wind, and they will really utilize habitats such as wetlands and open water. They'll also use old growth forest and higher elevations of mixed hardwood. Um, I have like personal experience with seeing moose in wetlands being from Newfoundland. I've often seen them just sort of sitting, no, they're standing in the middle of a bog, just kind of chewing away on the aquatic vegetation, which is really interesting. Um, the reason why they move between habitats is for thermal cover. They can't tolerate warm conditions and it's a behavioral adaptation to heat stress. So they actually display heat stress in the summer at 14 degrees Celsius. So thinking about this summer, it's been over 14 degrees Celsius quite frequently. So that means that the moose are gonna wanna be hunkered down in shade or hanging out in wetlands. Um, and uh, at this time they begin thermal panting. And then when we look at the winter, they prefer anything under minus five degrees Celsius. So they're, they're pretty sensitive to temperature, surprisingly. Um, moose will also spend most of the winter in large boreal or mixed forests. And then they'll sort of look around for small clearings with suitable browse. Uh, when we look at the female moose, they're called cows. They prefer lower elevations consisting of softwoods and regenerating stands. And this, this is due to the fact that in the spring, they want to have enough food supply to provide adequate milk for their calves, as well as like really good hiding places for them from predators. So the diet of the moose is kind of interesting. They prefer like higher shrubs. They don't really like having their head down super low. They want to stay alert. Um, they'll eat for eight hours a day, which is the entire day. Um, they can eat up to 70 pounds in a day on a good day. And the reason why they do this is to maintain their huge size. Um, bull moose can have a height of up to 6.6 .6 feet. And then cows are a little smaller, so they're around 5.6 feet. In Nova Scotia, um, moose will mainly consume uh, parts from trees like um, that's called forbs, but it's basically they'll eat mountain maple, sugar maple, red maple, yellow birch, um, balsam fir, and then they're pretty selective on what they're eating at what time. So depending on forage quality um, and depending on quantities, they will be really picky about what they're eating and when. Um, in the summer, moose eat aquatic vegetables, uh, aquatic vegetation, sorry. And the reason why they're doing this is because it contains nutrients and salts that they'll use um, to help with antler growth and also to help with producing milk. And a lot of these nutrients are lost over the winter because they're usually eating bark. Um, so this is kind of a cute slide, but moose end up rutting in the fall. And I thought it was really interesting. I don't know if anybody else saw the video of the moose in Tantalon. Um, and I know, unfortunately I heard that it had been hit by a car after that, but that happened in the fall and moose get really confused in the fall during rutting season. So they'll get sort of weird. You might see them running around in the road, making weird noises. Um, they have a lot of hormones flowing through them. For the bulls, we have, um, they have palm shaped antlers that can weigh up to 40 pounds and they can actually span up to six feet. I have a huge antler specimen um, from Bob Bancroft. He's, he's the, uh, he's sort of the, the moose expert. Um, 
and these antlers take five months to fully develop so it's it's they're pretty awesome uh the bull moose will then shed their antlers sometime in mid-december to late january so these are one of the things that uh, we can be looking for if we're like hiking out in the woods a dropped antler you can kind of you can really tell the difference between deer and moose because of the palmate shape um on top of that so rutting season is basically mating season they often mate in september and they have an eight month gestation period so that means that their calves will arrive in june um so they will hold on the the female cows will take care of their baby um, for about a year but in the next year um next calving season may to june she will often chase off her calf especially if it's a bull so this is another time um, may to june where you may see a really young confused moose running around um, maybe not so much in nova scotia but i have seen it in newfoundland i've seen you know really young looking moose in the middle of the street not knowing what a car is so it can be a little scary um, another cool fact about them is that they're usually solitary um, but my my grandfather actually told me the story of um, he was he was out moose hunting in newfoundland and he could see in the distance what he called a herd of moose and there was a bull moose in the front and he was packing down the heavy snow because this was in corner brook they get feet of snow and trailing behind him were a collection of younger moose as well as uh, cow moose and they were basically using him to pack down the snow so they didn't have to work as hard so that's sort of one of their behavioral adaptations um, with that all covered, I want to move into the threats to the moose. I, I did have a funny comment at the last event that I did. Someone said, um, why is why is the snake a threat to the moose? It's not a snake, it's a worm. It's supposed to represent the brain worm. It's really hard to get a picture of a parasite, so I did my best. Um, so starting with that, Nature Nova Scotia considers deer an invasive species. Um, not only were they intentionally introduced, they also followed uh, settlers coming in. So they were able to access areas of Nova Scotia that were previously inaccessible to them. And they thrive in the warmer climate, as well as younger forest types. So not only do these deer compete with moose for browse, uh, they also carry the gross parasite I'm going to call it brain worm. I don't think I could introduce that word. Yeah, I don't think I can do it. So maybe if someone wants to give it a shot after the presentation, that would be kind of fun. Um, and the thing is, the deer are totally fine with brain worm. They host it. Um, basically, what happens is it's kind of like a cycle. So the deer will accidentally eat a snail that contains the brain worm. Then the deer will get the brain worm, the deer will poop, and another snail will pick up the brain worm, and then the moose get it. And unfortunately, it's fatal to the moose. They develop neurological disorders. They, It's called moose sickness. Their ears will be flat to their head. They might be laying down in strange areas, um, kind of wobbly on their feet. And there is a reporting option for this on the DNR website as well. Um, and the brain worm, proved fatal uh, to the caribou so it's it's sort of indicative of where we're going with the moose a little bit I think um, this is kind of I find this photo really really sad um, habitat loss is is a huge issue in Nova Scotia I want to start a little bit by talking about wetlands um, it's actually wetland appreciation week which is unique to Nova Scotia and wetlands are really important for a lot of species. Um, me and me and Rebecca were out this weekend on sort of like a field trip with the Young Naturalist Club, and we were in a bog. There was 
there was this plant there that was only found in six bogs in the entire world. Um, not only that, we saw frogs, dragonflies, a swamp sparrow, and I think the director of Nature Nova Scotia, Becky, said she saw six snakes. Um, then on top of that, like I said earlier, the moose are using it to, to get nutrients that they can't find elsewhere, which is really important. And yeah, wet, wetlands aren't seen as valuable. And I, I think that that really needs to change, um, especially in our province. So then when I look at this photo, I, I know that moose need a mix of young and old forest, um, but this doesn't really leave much for them. Uh, we can see that when clear cutting, they leave uh, these trees called seed trees. They're basically lone standing trees. And the idea is that you leave a couple, they'll replenish the forest. Um, there's studies that show when you remove everything, you are removing nutrients from the soil and the composition is never the same, unfortunately. And while the moose will kind of use this habitat, they'll eat the regrowth. They don't want to stray too far from these like trees on on the outskirt and this doesn't even look I mean if I was a moose I wouldn't want to hide in there a predator would see you so unfortunately in Nova Scotia the area clear cut has doubled since the 1970s so much that 99 percent of forests in Nova Scotia today use clear cut methods including uh, shelter woods so um, forests with trees older than 80 years make up just 1% of Nova Scotia's forests. And a lot of that 1% is actually in Kedgee. So it's, it's a really small area. Uh, clear cutting and settlement led to lack of old growth forest. So the moose aren't able to regulate for shelter. Um, they're not able to um, eat like healthy food they're exposed basically. Um, not only that, on top of the obvious effects and direct effects of like habitat loss, we have to consider that um, clear cutting and forestry also like development into these areas are giving poachers access to moose. They're also promoting the immigration of the white-tailed deer, which is unfortunate because deer don't like to go Deer won't won't go through things that like reach up to their stomach. Like they won't go through thick growth like a moose can because the moose's legs are so high. And even snow, they won't go through heavy snow. Um, so after all that negativity, um, this is kind of a funny joke post that uh, Becky made, but we know that like lack of habitat connectivity has genetically stumped a lot of species. When we look at Nova Scotia, it's divided by highways. Um, and you sort of have like patchwork habitat. Uh, but basically, um, have you ever been in a situation like, yeah, she's cute, but she lives in Muscadabit and I'm in Yarmouth. Also, there are so many potholes on the way. So maybe you should just date your cousin instead. And you might be a moose because that is what is happening. If there's only 30 moose in an area, you can't get across the highway. Um, it's it's causing genetic issues with the population, and that's just where we're sitting. So this is kind of like a full list of threats. I can't I could talk about it forever, and it it can get really exhausting. So um, just some like extra things that I didn't really get a chance to talk about, like climate change. We know there's been large fires, there's been flooding that's impacting moose. Uh, large fires are not normal in the Wabanaki Acadian forest. Um, also, winter ticks are known to cause like blood loss, hair loss, uh, lack of appetite. And then they have uh, black bears, which will eat sick or young moose. And I kind of like this photo. This guy, he was from Miramichi and he tamed a moose. And he said that they're this is not an exact quote, but he did say that they are loyal, gentle creatures. Um, but yeah, I like to say humans in general are a threat to the moose, probably their biggest threat. So, and please, please don't try and ride a moose. Um, I think moose are really important. I also think it's kind of obvious they're found in every province 
in Canada except PEI and they're kind of like um they're kind of quintessential to Canadian culture like when you think of moose you think of Canada I also know that like the species is really important in, uh, from an indigenous perspective um recently I had a meeting with the Acadia First Nations and um my contact there was showing me how they would use the moose hip bone as a mask. Um, they also use like the shoulder bone to attract other moose species. So they would kind of scrape it along trees and that would attract like bull moose, which was very interesting to me. Um, like traditionally they, um, indigenous populations would have used the moose as a source of food, clothing and shelter. And there have been traces found of moose antlers and bone and shell heaps of, across the entire province. Um, aside from that, I think they can provide food for humans. Like, you know, ideally we would be able to coexist with these animals and use them to the best of our ability. The food chain relies on them and they're just really cool animals. They, they bring people around and I think they're beautiful. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about the future of the mainland moose. So this is kind of a long tail, but basically listed as endangered as of 2003. Um, 2007, we have a little bit of a late recovery plan. 2007 to 2019, we have meetings. Um, and then 2019, nature groups took the province to court. Uh, then we have a bit of a late uh, recovery plan, which includes core habitat. And now in 2023, we are cooperating uh, with DNRR on a research project um, and hoping to push for the designation um, of core habitat. That's kind of the dream plan. So the recovery plan is a scientific planning document that's required for all threatened species. It identifies risk factors and sets goals for the recovery. It also identifies core habitat. So um, the green here is core habitat on mainland Nova Scotia. It includes specific areas of habitat essential for the species long-term survival and recovery. In the case of the moose, this includes large intact mixed forests. And the really important part, which I know uh, the recovery planning team works super hard on was um, this connectivity piece. So we, we know we have the pockets, but they need to be able to flow. Um, and especially even the flow here to New Brunswick is really important. And the 20 year goal is to increase the number to 5,000 individuals. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the research project. So we got we have some really dedicated followers and donors, and we raised about $20,000 for the Species at Risk Fund. And so um, we launched, Nature Nova Scotia launched our mainland moose research project. Uh, there's two main goals of this. Our primary objective is to do sort of a community outreach piece. So we want to gain a scientific understanding of public knowledge, appreciation, and desires surrounding the mainland moose. Um, and then secondly, we want to increase moose reportings to the provincial hotline. So I wanna teach uh, people who are already out and about in the woods how to identify moose tracks, how to identify pellets, take photos of them, and how to submit them onto DNR's website. And this is really important for population tracking. Um, so we know that this, this project is really important because, um, we are unsure about public opinion. Like I said, a lot of people think the mainland moose is the same as the Cape Breton moose and just sort of the education piece is so important. Like I said, for population tracking, and then the more support, the more we learn, the more we can make a meaningful impact. Um, I have, one of the ways that I'm doing this is like a series, I'm gonna do a series of events and I'm gonna plug my event at the end of this, but um, inviting people to come out and see some 
natural history items. So like moose antlers, uh, moose hoofs, moose pellets, and then taking them out in the woods and, and teaching them how to properly identify them. Um, I also have a survey that Nature Nova Scotia worked on. So the survey covers a lot of different questions, but it's it's really important that we get more people to fill that out. We're gonna uh, put all this to good use in our literature review. And I can put the link in the chat for this survey. Uh, if anybody has the time to do it, I would really appreciate it. Um, talking about uh, Muma moose reporting is kind of fun. So I actually have mock moose pellets, which I take around with me. Um, but just, just to begin, please, like, if you see a moose, do not approach it. They're not really afraid of humans, like, not, not so much as deer, like, they will stop and stare at you, and then a cow with a baby is very dangerous, as well as a bull in the fall rut. Um, most importantly, I just want to say that you can report uh, moose pellets, you can report shed antlers, uh, if you think a moose was chewing on a twig, you can report that, as well as an actual sighting. Um, all you need to do is, is to go, you can just Google DNR moose, mainland moose reporting, uh, click on the link, and then you provide some details on where you saw it, how it was doing. The coordinates are wonderful, but if you don't have them, just a general location. Um, this is how I remember the difference maybe wondering about these photos. Um, so I like to say moose pellets are like chocolate covered almonds because they're much bigger. And um, deer pellets are more like chocolate covered raisins. I couldn't find a picture of chocolate covered raisins, but regular raisins will do. Um, and then when we look at hoof prints, we can see moose is a lot larger than deer. And the only thing in Nova Scotia that would have a comparable print to a moose would be a cow. So it's it's pretty easy to tell. They're really heavy, they have deep imprints, and they're huge. Um, and if you're unsure, please, please send me all your poop photos. I love getting, I love getting really fun photos. Um, my email is jess.lewis at natureanus.ca. Um, with that, what you can do, you can do the survey. So I'll post the link to that. We have petitions, we have lawn signs. Um, you can come out to events. We're looking for volunteers and just in general support stewardship. Ideally, we would we would love to have no more clear cutting of public lands. We would like to prioritize research funding and designate all pending protected areas, um, as well as special management practices for industries like forestry and mining. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly like plug my events. So August 26th, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do like a guided hike, guided moose ID hike. So identifying moose tracks, pellets, and other sign, um, and then how to report it on the DNR website. Plus there's going to be snacks and lots of cool moose stuff. This is on the, uh, the St. Paul's Ang Anglican Church property, which they're actually trying to convert into a green burial site um, and conservation area, which is really cool of them. Um, on Saturday, August 19th, I'm going to be at Shubenacadie Wildlife Park for Wetlands Appreciation Week. Again, talking about the moose, why they use, um, why they use wetlands, why wetlands are super important habitat. So there's a park tour, guided hike, crafts, and then I'm going to be sitting at a booth with 30 pound moose antlers, which is awesome. Um, and then on Sunday, I'm going to do a guided hike and volunteer training. So you can register for that if you're interested in anything moose related. I'm gonna talk a little bit about identifying plants, lichens, animals, insects, and fungi, and then how we plan on engaging youth in nature activism initiatives this year. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you so much everybody for coming please check out our website if you want more information. 
um, you can sign up for our mailing list. We send out like, I'd say we send out an email like once a month with different events, webinars, things you can attend to. And then our socials are also really important for keeping up to date. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm now free to answer any questions you all have about the moose. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Um, yeah, and you're more than welcome to write questions in the chat as well. You can read them out and answer them too. Um, but I do have a question. Um, between species of the moose, is there like major differences that like you could like you could look at one and be like, that's for sure uh, this type of moose and that's for sure that type of moose kind of thing? I think like genetically they're very distinct and I know like if you saw if you saw an eastern moose next to like an Alaskan Yukon moose like the the Alaska moose would be way bigger um and then there's kind of like aside from the genetic differences like there's not a lot of like research done on like the physical dif physical appearance differences um yeah so genetically distinct Physically, if you were really familiar with moose, yeah, you probably could. I'm gonna put the link to my survey in the chat as well. Do you have a question, Fisher? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, Gary Fisher from Wallace here. I used to work with Lands and Forest a number of years ago. I started in 1978 as a private land technician. And a lot of the areas that we had a lot of area here was long before the cutting and a lot of the cutting and stuff that took place. And, you know, I can certainly remember as a kid growing up on the farm, it was easy to call moose. I called lots of moose over my lifetime when moose were around. But uh, all the moose that I collected off the highways and in the woods and stuff all had the brainworm, or 99% of them did. So I'm just wondering, uh, the deer are the host of that brainworm. So I'm just wondering if there are any plans in the works that you have to take some aggressive action against white-tailed deer. Because I realize, I know that habitat is important, but uh, when you have that kind of uh, worm that's... Uh, processed with deer that personally I think there has to be some aggressive action against white-tailed deer in order to speed up this process and uh, there's been a lot of research done with lands and forest uh, on heads that they collected and I collected well over 200 of them and um, every almost every one of them had the brain worm so it kind of makes sense to me that your first initial I realize that we're, we're doing habitat re restoration but don't you believe that you're really going to have to take some aggressive action against white-tailed deer because they're the host of the brain worm. And as long as they're in the numbers they are, like I in Cumberland County, we don't have a doe draw or anything. We're allowed to sh I'm allowed to shoot one deer of either sex, but we don't have the hunters. So one time we had 100,000 people in this province that got deer licenses, and now we're down to 40, 14 to 15,000. So I don't know like uh, what you're gonna do about it. But mm -hmm. I, you know, so I'm wondering, are, is there any plans to take some aggressive action against white-tailed deer because they're the host of the brain war? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was gonna bring up the, the study. So I know that there's a study being, being funded right now to look more into the brain worm. Um, but yeah, there's, there is only so much a study can do. And we definitely want to take like a holistic approach to um, the moose issue. Like, it, I don't think it's just habitat. I, I think you're right. I think it's a little, a little bit of everything. I think it's the brain worm, it's habitat loss. There's so many different parts and pieces. Um, I guess a question I would have for you is, have you seen like a decline in hunters overall, or is it a decline in, um, because I know that like one way to get hunters to go out is to start young, but like a lot of the youth camps that used to do hunting don't do it anymore because safety reasons. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely a decline in hunters. I mean, it's not, it, you know, the hunting one time 
you know, the Chronicle Herald uh, a week before the deer season opened was a full edition about places to go hunting in Nova Scotia, the hunting, different hunting aspects of the province. And uh, basically the anti-hunting movement has been just basically making everybody feel it's taboo to even do that kind of activity. And uh, so, you know, like uh, the numbers are the numbers are no longer there. I mean, it's not, I, I grew up on a farm in a rural area and hunting was a traditional activity. My grandfather hunted and uh, I still hunt. I've been hunting and trapping for 55 years. I caught my first beaver 55 years ago when I was 10. And, uh, but, so I don't think we'll ever, I don't know if we'll ever see the numbers of deer hunters back again, but you know, some of the solution might be, for example, you know, people, we're gonna to have to stop loving deer. That means that lands and forest is gonna to have to stop having doe draws. We don't need to buy a license. We can just have a habitat. Uh, we don't need a bag limit on white-tailed deer because any excess deer that I would shoot, I, I, I could donate that to feed Nova Scotia. I have to pay for that. It costs me $50 for when I do the donation, but you know what I mean? That's a pretty important aspect because people say, well, what are you gonna do with the meat? Uh, the other thing that has to be looked at, and I can tell you as a trapper, this is a hard pill for me to swallow. And I know there's gonna be a lot of people upset at me, but I really need, think there needs to be more protection on coyotes. And the reason why I say that is a coyote will eat three and a half deer a year. And um, in order to, we have a lot of areas that are urban rural populations. Like for example, I'm not allowed to discharge a rifle within 480 meters of a residence uh, without uh, the owner's permission. 185 meters with a bow and arrow or a shotgun. So the, there's a lot of deer in those urban areas and there's only one way to take it out, take them out and the coyotes have to eat them. It's that simple. Yeah. And uh, unless we start looking, I, you know, that's a hard pill for me to swallow because I've caught a lot of coyotes in my lifetime. And, it's, and I know a lot of trappers that have, but yeah, uh, really the culprit here I see is the white tailed deer. And I know that there's issues, I know there's issues with habitat. So uh, it's gonna be a hard sell because, you know, <laughs> it's gonna be a hard sell because people like deer, you know, we're, we're, we're taking in orphan deer and those deer are being raised and then they're released right back into moose habitat. Mm -hmm. okay. So all that's- I would, I would love to hear, you know, all that you have to say on the survey. Like if, if you haven't filled it out. I'll, I'll oh yes, I've survey. already, I've already filled out the survey. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, no, I, 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 I certainly did. You know, that was a good survey. That's one of the best ones I've seen yet because Thank it you. covered a lot of aspects and I certainly would encourage anybody to fill it out. Awesome. Regardless if you're pro-forestry or pro, you know, anti-forestry or whatever, there's a lot of questions there that covers every aspect of, of what you think. Okay, it's thank it's you one of the- Thank you very much. I'm gonna answer like a couple other questions and- Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so, I don't know, Rebecca, do you wanna read out the questions and then I'll try and answer? Um, I believe the first one is thoughts on why the population count hasn't been done in 20 years. It's not like they're still doing aerial surveys every winter. Um, it was kind of explained to me that they only do winter surveys because that's when their helicopters are available. Uh, the full population count, I think that was a huge undertaking. And I think I mean, like ideally I would I would like for it to be done again, but thinking about DNR's like capacity to take that on um, is it's it would be huge. So, you know, I would I would really like to have one done, but right now we're relying a lot on public reporting and then those winter surveys. And then the next one is that there's a lot of building initiatives going forward because of the housing crisis. Um, is there any con con conservation plans that have been kind of put in place to advocate for the for the forests right now, kind of to combat the housing plans almost? Yeah. Yeah, that that is also a tough question to answer. Um, it being it being a housing crisis, it's it's really difficult to work around that. 
Um, I know there, there are a lot of problems with development being pushed forward. I think it would be really nice to have um, some laws that would encourage developers to build upwards a little more and then encourage more habitat connectivity. I also know like like recently the province it was, it was a couple months ago but the province released um, their plan for like the highways in Nova Scotia and repairing roads and I think they probably should have had a bit of a budget for like habitat connectivity. Um, so yeah working conservation plans into that has has been really difficult but uh, a lot of nature organizations are like banding together and we do work together. So hopefully we can work to, towards like advocating more for that. Um, another question is, are there any efforts to introduce moose from another province for genetic diversity? Or like what would those some issues with that be? Um, so the thing is, it would it would be really nice to think that we could just take some moose from New Brunswick and sort of drop them off in Nova Scotia and hope that that would help. Um, but I think this I think the issue with the moose it's it's more than that. It's not it's not that there just isn't genetic diversity. It's that you know are we going to bring in these moose and then they might not be able to survive because there's not enough food or they might just end up getting the brain worm and dying or there's actually not enough habitat and then they start competing with each other so it's it's more of like a holistic nova scotia issue than it is um just as easy as like introducing species or introducing the species from uh, different areas um, are there any other options? I think killing other species. There's, there is a study at Acadia University, um, and one of the things that they ask people to do is to, like, if you're a hunter and you collect deer heads, just like Gary was saying, um, you can take the heads in and drop them off, or you can drop them off at the DNR office and they'll bring it over. So, I know they're doing studies on that. I don't know the depth of the studies. Um, and yeah, they're they're working on the research. Hopefully that will be released very soon. There's one here by Kennedy, I'm not quite sure about. Um, Aerial spray. Aerial spray of glyph, yeah, for of glyphosate camps are set up in various sites. Um, I know Nature NS has done, like I can't speak directly on that, but I know we did do a petition. Um, specifically, the reason why we don't, why Nature Nova Scotia doesn't like um, the aerial spraying is because, um, it's it's basically used to get rid of like deciduous trees. So it makes forests more like, it makes forests more softwood. So it's all softwood needle trees. Um, and then that reduces like biodiversity. Um, so that means like providing less habitat and less food and also creating a better environment for um, like for forestry industry, which is, yeah, it's it's definitely tricky. Um, we have our pe petition, but uh, Geraldine, feel free to just email me, and we can try and have a conversation about it. I have another question. the The highways, because the highways are always under construction. The overpasses or like the areas for animals to cross, are they like equipped for moose crossing? Or are they like mostly like coyote and like small animal? Because I don't ever remember seeing anything big enough that like a moose can go over or under a highway or is that there I just don't see it um moose moose have moose have used the highway crossing um I'm not like 
I know they're quite expensive, but we do we do have a highway crossing here. Like I and I think it's proven that they would use it, but the big thing is, yeah, Coba could pass as those. So I think the deer are using them as well. And then moose tend to like avoid deer, but, but also get really sick when they're around deer. Um so it's kind of it's kind of a tricky issue. Like wildlife overpasses and underpasses definitely work and they're excellent. They'll like reduce the amount of vehicle collisions. Um, they'll reduce the amount of like roadkill, dead animals, things like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of tricky for the moose specifically. Like you you don't get to pick which animals go through, so it's hard to say. And then there's another question here in the chat. Um, one person says the region is doing mass planning around the town for development. What sort of things would be best to suggest best to suggest to promote habitat connectivity? Okay, so yeah, when we're looking at habitat connectivity, like I would go back to the core habitat plan. So when we looked at the core habitat um, in the map that they did. Uh, you can see that like they already put in those like really important connector areas. So like, for example, if your region, like you said, is doing the mass planning, um, you could, well, you can show them the map of core habitat and, you know, say this area is important. Um, and like, ideally core habitat would would be designated and all pending protected areas would also be designated. But um, it's it's definitely tricky because it hasn't really been done provincially before. It's been done federally, but not provincially. So I guess the first step in all of this is this education piece, like it is coming to the webinars. And then you can always go to like community meetings and and sort of speak on behalf of this this map because there is that data to um, back you up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any updates on that initiative there. Um, I did look into that. I know they did it for, um, I, I want to say they did it for Valentine, Valentine's Day and they had like pins, things like that. Um, I don't think it's been updated at all. I like, I haven't personally reached out to them. I probably should, but I know it's, and it's like an important area because um, the Chinecto Isthmus is like just this tiny sort of land bridge that's connecting Nova Scotia to New Brunswick. So it is a really important channel. Um, I know that the Nature Conservancy of Canada has like protected a lot of um, a lot of the Isthmus, which is really good. Um, they've done that through like land donations and um, sort of like fundraising and things like that. But I don't have I don't have any updates on that project specifically. Do like do you know if any other province has had the same issue and kind of come out of it before? Like done like the the correct steps and kind of come back from the low population. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. I know like when I when I'm writing the literature review, I'm. I'm working, like I, I'm looking at how other provinces manage their moose population, like specifically looking at Newfoundland, because mm -hmm. like they had like high population and then it dipped kind of low again and now they're back up high. So like I am going to be looking into those population fluctuations and things like that. But um, I don't know of any like moose rehabilitation projects. Mm -hmm. but 
hopefully this this will be the first one and the best one. <laughs> Uh, Ray will remember the chocolate covered almonds um, in comparison to raisins. That's good. That's why I always say it so people don't forget. And take pictures, please. I do actually remember, Gary, that Turo is doing um, like culling on deer. So they are kind of working on in like inner city, well, inner town um, deer removal. So they are kind of, I, I feel like they're kind of feeling out to introduce to people that like this is kind of something that's going to start happening is that we're going to have to start taking action on the deer because clearly they're not doing it themselves. So so I do think that towns and, and stuff are starting to try to show people that something's kind of start happening with the deer because it's getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? I think that's it. Yeah, we pretty much hit it right on the dot, eight o'clock there. Thank you everybody for coming out and joining us at this presentation. We, the NSCN consistently has webinars informational on this and you can stay updated with our social medias or our website. Um, yeah, thank you again for coming out and thank you, Jess, for your presentation and all your information. And hopefully you can fill up that survey and take some action action on this uh, issue here. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a great night.